Millions of people are affected by mental illness each year. One in five adults experience mental illness, according to the National Alliance on Mental Illness. One in 20 US adults experience serious mental illness in this country. 17% of youth, that's ages six to 17 years old, experience a mental health disorder. Today, I'll be speaking with Mel Schwartz. He's a psychotherapist, marriage counselor, author, two-time TEDx speaker, podcaster, and a leadership consultant. Today, we'll also be talking about his book, and let me just see if it shows up. Sometimes it doesn't show up here, The Possibility Principle, How Quantum Physics Can Improve the Way You Think, Live, and Love. Fascinating title, Mel. Welcome to my podcast show. Thank you, Michael. It's so nice to meet you live. Yeah, no, this is exciting. Um, as I told you, I, I did read the entire book, just an amazing combination of something, quantum physics and psychology. I did read your story and your background on it, but maybe we could just give a quick little overview, you know, how, how you came about that. Well, I'll, I'll try to make it quick. Sure, for sure. Here's a story. I had recently divorced. Um, through the divorce process um, and some unsettling circumstances, um, my sons ended up living with me. They were young. On one particular day on the weekend, they were off with some friends. I had time to myself. I went out for a bike ride on a beautiful spring day. And in the middle of the bike ride, I had a panic attack. Mm. I'd never had one before. Mm. My anxiety was about a fear of the, the unknown. I had just started a new career as a psychotherapist in my early 40s, mm. gone through a divorce, had significant financial concerns. Every thought started to cascade into fear. So I turned the bike around and headed back home. I had no idea why, what relief I would get getting back into my house. When I got into the house, I pulled a book off the shelf called The Turning Point, yeah. written by the quantum physicist Fridjof Capra. And I started to read about what he called a paradigm shift. In other words, reality was not the way I thought or what we were taught as kids. We were still thinking based upon 17th century reality coming to at us from Newton and Descartes. They created what was called a machine-like universe yeah. where everything was disconnected from everything else. And it required cause and effect and force to make movement. That's why change would be hard. Well, in this book, I started to read this new reality coming to us from quantum physics, which suggested that reality is not predictable and certain. Mm -hmm. It's altogether awash with uncertainty. And I had a, a, a startling moment where I thought, why does the word uncertain have to be a negative? Yeah. I was fearful just moments before about my future. And I thought, what if I looked at uncertainty as full of possibility? rather than fear. I also read that reality is magically interwoven and interconnected. In fact, interconnected is the wrong word. It still speaks to a separation. Reality is inseparable. It's one seamless whole, like the Eastern mystics had always written about. I was spellbound and I noticed I was no longer anxious. I had no more fear. And I thought, wow. So this shift in reality calmed me and inspired me. Well, I lose track of the decades, Michael, but it's many decades later. And that moment was pivotal. I started to read. When I say read quantum physics, I don't mean the math. I was a right. poor science student. The <laughs> principles. Right. I started to integrate them into my life and develop a new way of thinking and then started to apply it in my work as a therapist and saw the results in which I could help people overcome anxiety, develop authentic self-esteem, develop effective communication skills, all together transform our life experience. I owe it to that moment, picking up that book. And that's what led me 
to write the possibility principle. Fascinating. I mean, who would have thought that you could take something like that from a, a hard science where you look at something like psychotherapy, which tends to be the softer type of you know, skills. And it really, as you said, there is an interconnectedness. We, we really try hard to separate it our mind and our body. And as you've said quite often, I've heard you talk about the mind and body and body are the same. The mind is part of the body. And we really want to try to compartmentalize these things and they're not separate. And, and therefore you may have heard me say there is no mind body connection, right? Because the word connection implies a separation. Yeah. So we shouldn't even speak of the mind-body connection. Yeah. That, that semantics doesn't serve us. Mind and body are as one. If I looked at, if I took my five fingers and placed them in the sand and we saw five different little circles in the sand, would we think that those fingers must be separate? No, they're part of the same hand. Yeah. I think that one of the things that I took from, from listening to you and what initially really started my listening to your podcast show uh, is what you touched on about anxiety and, and panic and those type of things where we are really looking for certainty in the future. And we're trained, we're taught to try to seek those things. And when we don't have it, we get scared. We, we, we try to predict all the outcomes. We, we, and, and as you pointed out, we don't often consider the positive outcomes. We just focus on, at least for myself, who, who has tended towards anxious type thinking, all I think about is trying to prepare myself for every infinitesimal little negative thing or consequence that could happen. And yet I'm not helping myself because I'm not looking at the possibilities of the things that could positively impact out of this situation. And I think that's probably been the biggest uh, takeaway that I've taken among the many I've taken away from, from your, your teachings is, is that anxiety doesn't always have to be something that's, you know, it, for me, in, in some ways, it triggers me to kind of think a little differently um, about my thoughts. Well, exactly so. And anxiety is simply put, um, is what happens when our thoughts attached to fear. Yeah. So we have a fancier word, anxiety. Mm -hmm. So my thoughts are attaching to fear. What can we do about that? Well, we can learn to see our thought and not become that thought. Mm. I call it developing a muscle memory. So when I work with individuals to see their thought, many different exercises. One is I start to language it differently. I'll say, you know, while we were speaking, Michael, I had a thought come up. Let me tell you what my thought is telling me. You see what I've done right there? I made thought representative. I separated myself from thought. So there's a me that's more than my thought. Now that's not the way we operate as humans. Mm. Right. Thought tricks us. David Bohm, the quantum physicist, um, spoke of this, that thought is literal. Thought tricks us in that it's telling us the truth. Yeah. Now, thought is neither telling us the truth or an untruth. Thought just makes stuff up. Now, do I want to be imprisoned by the innumerable I don't know if it's hundreds of thousands or millions of thoughts I will have. Yeah. And by the way, the moment I have a thought, the thought summons up the accompanying feeling. So why do we say it's hard to change? Hmm. Well, because if we're imprisoned by the same old habitual thoughts and feelings, then we struggle to change. So yeah. what's the way out? To slow down and learn to develop the capacity to see thought. Now, an exercise toward doing that is throughout the day, any number of times, ask yourself, what's the last thought I had? See it. Don't argue with it. 
Don't judge it, don't evaluate it, see it, release it. Kind of like people who fish and catch and release. See the thought, release it. Now, after you've done that a number of times, and I don't know if that's 500 times or 5,000 times, you will develop this memory, this muscle memory, whereby it becomes instinctive. Now, I would say up till this moment in my life, I believe that it is singularly the most important thing we yeah. can do to live on an entirely different level, to break free from the imprisonment of all thought and all feeling. And it's accomplishable. Yeah, I agree because I, the things that you've been teaching, I've been practicing myself. And the other thing that sticks in my mind that I love that you've said is the most important relationship that you can have above any other relationship with your family, your mother, father, spouse, is your relationship with your thoughts. And I've never thought that way before because I too had lived as a prisoner in my own mind. And sometimes I'd, I would use things to try to block those things out, whether it's music or self-talk and things. And what I realize is instead of being fearful of those things is to really step back and go, all right, you're having this thought. What's really going on here? And what's the reality of it? And I think where I struggle still sometimes, and I'm getting better with it, is that emotional attachment to it. So you hear the thought and then you, um, you, you feel something. It's, it's, as I tell my wife all, all the time, there's no lion chasing me. And yet we, something happens and my reaction is to it is, you know, whether it's a small thing or not, to, to just start getting those heightened feelings. And so, so when that happens, Michael, yeah. try doing the same thing with the feeling that you do with the thought. Yeah. Just see the feeling and say, I don't want to become the feeling. I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling fearful. Okay. Let me understand why I'm feeling that way. Right. And what was the thought I had that set up the feeling? So I had a thought, a fearful thought, and that set up the anxious feeling. Oh, that's it. So it was just that thought. Okay, I can let that go. It's just a thought, it's just a feeling. Isn't it amazing though, how much, how much of our lives get ruled by an, an emotional, just how much emotional investment we put into something like a thought. I, I can think of times during the day, and I've talked to many people, something happens at work. Their boss says something, they assume, oh, shoot, my boss is mad at me. They obsess about it all night. I'm guilty of it. Next day, the thing you worried about, and I'm going to tell you, Mel, and I, I don't have statistics on it, but I, I'll tell my wife this, at least 90% of the time or more, the thing that I, very thing I wasted all that time being anxious about doesn't come to fruition. And that's when I really started to realize what's really going on here. I'm pretty bad at predicting the outcome, number one. <laughs> so, you know, and it's, it's wasted time that I could spend in joy instead of not, you know, I could also look at the opposite side, as you say, and look and say, well, Maybe something great's going to happen in this situation or nothing. So, so going, going yeah. into that problematic piece, Mike, right. realizing the vast majority of the time you're worrying and stressing over something that your thought made up. Right. So what can you choose to do differently about that? Well, it's, it, I think you, you look at, the, I think for me is being realistic. I, I think for a lot of people I've talked to, including my, you know, my, I can say for myself, I'm always trying to prepare myself for the worst outcome for some reason, you know? And so something comes up that triggers a thought that says, my boss is mad at me. And they're like, uh oh, well, I need my job. I don't want her to be mad at me. And it could have been, well, Mike, maybe she's having a rough day. Maybe she's, but I don't think about those things, right? The first thing I do is, is blame myself. And a lot of people do. And I think that's what happens when um, some of these types of anxious thoughts happen. So Michael, let's look at your operating belief, which is setting up this cascade of thoughts. Good point. That happening. So your orientation and your belief is bad stuff's going to happen. Right. Okay. Shit is going to happen. Exactly. Okay. 
how did do you know how you came to that primary belief i'm sure i do it's probably my upbringing growing up in an unstable environment have a father who drank and you're i think i always worried about what bad thing might happen next because i had to prepare myself because it was unpredictable the behavior could come out his anger outbursts could come out and so as a child i think i learned to kind of take a step and say all right if i see something that looks like it could have the potential to have some negative consequences i need to be ready because okay. of yeah so you grew up in an emotionally perhaps physically i don't know unsafe environment right now due to having an alcoholic dad right okay it's regrettable it is but it sets you up to have a hyper vigilance right what's going to go wrong so you can prepare number one when you were young, that was actually a coping mechanism. Exactly. Right. But now, all these decades later, that coping mechanism doesn't serve you any longer. It became a dysfunction because you are safe. You're not a child right. at risk of an alcoholic death. So number one, think that coping mechanism is no longer coping. It's the opposite of coping. Yeah. Number two, my operating belief system, what could go wrong, doesn't serve me. Mm. I'm not in battle. I'm not at war. Um, that operating belief system doesn't serve me. You know, in my book, I refer to those as wave collapses. Yes. Pieces that shaped our identity. So, Michael, you need to go back to your primary wave collapse. I'm not safe. See how it informed your belief system. And then say to yourself, this doesn't serve me. Yeah. And then make an in a willful intention. I no longer want to operate from fear. Yeah. I no longer want to operate in a danger zone. If my car goes into a skid in the wintertime, I have a right to be fearful. Right. Now, every time you see your thought going off to worst case scenarios. Now you stop yourself. You say, well, wait a minute. That's coming from an old belief system, an old coping mechanism from childhood. I need to break free. Now, breaking free is summoning new possibility into your life. Right. Now the question is, how do you do that? Your listeners right now may be saying, oh, this sounds great. Sure, right. How in the hell do you do it? Okay. Yeah by embracing uncertainty. Yeah. Here, the uncertainty might be, but who would I be if <laughs> I am not the me I know? You see, very often, we want to make change. We want to overcome dysfunction. What holds us back? It's the uncertainty of who would I be if I'm different than me? Mm. So there's an irony in there. We're trying to shed something that encumbers us and burdens us. And yet there's this irrational piece of, but who would I be? Well, I'd be someone without fear. Wouldn't that be good? So we have to welcome the uncertainty and invite it in to break free. And you brought up a good point too, Mel, earlier. It's, you know, when, when we talk about how do you do these things and how many times, you know, one of the things I had to learn early on as I was listening to a lot of your uh, shows is that, there isn't a number of times that that's prescribed here. It's sort of, you got to keep practicing some of these types of thinking in order to be able to, to get it to be part of your habit, because, you know, you've set up, I'm 51. I've had all these years that I've been thinking one way, but it doesn't mean I have to be a prisoner of that type of thinking. I, as you're talking, I had a new thought occur to me, brand new thought just in this moment which is it's like saying to yourself how many times will i have to breathe yeah. right well hopefully i'll have to breathe as many moments as possible yeah so in other words it's, it shouldn't we shouldn't look at this ability to learn to see your thought as how long will i have to do that hopefully i want to be able to do that forever right because it's freeing 
But it, it does become second nature and instinctive. So you don't have to put all this work into it. That's a really great way of thinking about it too, because I think for a lot of things that I've changed over my life, as you know, I think we talked about my life transformation too and my weight loss. And I really had to learn um, new things to do that were um, old habits that I used for dealing with stress. And I think early on, we talked about my routine of self-care, which I really had very basic back before. And I had to learn to be proactive in taking on new habits that would serve me better. So meditation, um, I get up and exercise, those type of things, right? So that prepare me best for the day. But it, it, took, it took for a while a conscious effort to get up in the morning at 5 a.m. to do these things. It took me... And, you know, and I think for some people it's like, well, boy, getting up early and doing these things, I could never do that. And I think for myself, I had to learn that as I started to see the benefits, as I've seen with the things you've been teaching, it becomes easier because it, it, it's one of those things that gives you a good sense of um, inside. You know, I, I, I do worry less now. I do focus more on the positive because uh, I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't learn those things. Um, you know, one of the things I've said about even with my, my, my obese condition that I was in, um, it wasn't so much what I was eating, it was what was eating me. And I think people don't realize that whether it was worry, or it was feeding myself food to for comfort, uh, which still doesn't go away. <laughs> I had to learn some new skills to be able to uh, kind of deal with the day-to-day -day stuff. As you said earlier, shit's going to happen all the time. <laughs> so, Michael, did you ever come to clarity about why you needed to eat to comfort yourself? I think it was just something I saw and probably was taught. I think that um, in our home, love is shown with food, as in many homes. And let's face it, most of us, like to eat and get a good sense. You know, we, we don't just eat for uh, nutrition. Most of us eat because we like the taste. We like the way it makes us feel. And when you associate those feels with com feelings with comfort, hence comfort food, it becomes a, a very temporary solution for, for feeling good, but it also becomes a big problem, especially for those of us, you know, who it, it gets out of control. It became like any other addiction for me. It became so much so that it, it, it was cyclical. The more out of shape I became, the worse my mental health became, and uh, the more I ate because of it. And, and you mentioned control there, which is you're out of control, but the irony is it was the one thing you could be in control over, which is I'll eat as much as I want to. You're in control of that. As a child, as a dad who had a drinking issue, you were not in control. Right. But ultimately, how much you were going to put into your mouth was your determination. Sure. So it was the opposite. So in terms of, you know, comfort food or the comfort of eating, um, one thing I learned, I never had a weight issue. Yeah. So for, for me, it was it's at some point, maybe it was a vanity issue and <laughs> a, little bit, a little bit of belly. But what I learned to do was to become aware of the feeling of becoming full, satiated. Yeah. Right? Of learning that I could push back the chair from the table prior to feeling full. So when you feel full, it gives off a, a, a chemical reaction, which may be comfort, I'm not sure. But that I could actually stop myself before I felt full and then walk away from the table and think, oh, I feel good. I don't need to feel satiated and full. And that's what comfort eating is about, isn't it? Right. You know, an interesting thing you point out, a thought occurred to me as you were talking, you have something that I struggled with, which was understanding satiation. So to me, sometimes I didn't know the difference between feeling anxious and hungry, number one, which is a strange, it's, it almost sounds strange to say it, but I, I didn't 
anxious and anxiety and hungry almost went together to me. And the other thing is, I didn't really understand when I was satiated. Um, I often ate to capacity because uh, that's what I learned. I didn't know where satiation, I had never experienced it really, or at least knew what it felt like. And it becomes distorted or it became distorted. Um, mm. And it's still, it, the lines are still blurry to me to this day sometimes. Uh, but I did train myself in, in terms of being able to uh, deal with some of those things because um, satiation is really the way we're supposed to eat. Uh, that's the way our bodies were, were built. Um, but I think for a lot of people, this is my experience. I, I don't know what you've experienced. They don't know where that line is or they lose it. Well, it, it may have a deep ancestral tug because, you know, prior to civilized modernity, yeah. our ancestors would have to forage for food or, or kill animals to sure. have an assurance as to where the next meal would come from or when. Yeah. So they might actually, I'm speculating, I don't know this. I'm right, making right. this up as I'm going <laughs> on. No, but it's out here. I need here. to overeat as, as protection. Interesting. They wouldn't know this five hours later, they'll have another meal. Yeah, true. So there may be an ancestral instinctive quality to yeah. this as well. So it requires retraining our mind, which is okay. There's food in the refrigerator or service to deliver my food. And I'm not at risk of missing my next meal unless I choose to. Right. Right. And, and that's how it goes. And as we're understanding the changes in health and nutrition now, right. We're understanding the power of fasting. So at first the idea of fasting seemed bizarre to me. How could I do that? But I, I read about, um, a basic keto fast, which is called 12 3. Yep. I read about it. it was simple 12, 12 hours. So you need to fast for 12 hours. So from your last meal in the evening, you eat nothing for 12 hours. So I thought, okay, if I eat my dinner at seven and don't graze and eat anything else after dinner, can I make it till seven in the morning? Well, of mm -hmm. course. I'm going to sleep. So I started to institute that recently. No food for 12 hours. Your body needs 12 hours of fasting. That's easy. The three was don't get into bed until at least three hours okay. after you've eaten dinner. Yep. Because it messes up your sleep because sure. your body is weak and digesting. Yep. So I thought 12, three, let me try that. And it's easy. Yeah. It's easy to break the habit. You just have to get the discipline. I'm feeling hungry. That doesn't mean I have to get up and go into the kitchen. I'm feeling hungry. You notice the feeling. You don't become the feeling. Yeah. Well, we we don't have time to get into my my nighttime binge eating and all that too. Well, that could be another topic or another day. But it it. Um... I'll have you on my podcast. <laughs> And I'll interview you about that and help you out with that, Michael. Oh, awesome. Hey, I'll, I'll take that. That's that's really awesome. But, you know, another thought that I, it came about that, that I don't know that you talk about much, but I'm interested to hear your, your take on is the effect that nutrition has on our mental health. I'm starting to see more and more um, emphasis on that. And in fact, the new um, president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is a psychiatrist, which I was excited to see because... You know, when we're looking at um, the treatment of any chronic illness, okay, whether it's a mental illness or it's a physical illness, you know, they say over 80% of these chronic conditions are because of our lifestyle, not just, you know, environmental issues, but our lifestyles are contributing to these things. And I'm curious your thoughts on even just, you know, nutrition and mental health. Have you seen um, like with the foods we eat today, which are highly processed, loaded with sugar, loaded with all kinds of things. Would you agree that these also have an impact on? Uh, it would be implausible that they don't right. have a significant impact. Yeah. How, could they, how could they not? Yeah. Uh, besides um, the processing and the additives, 
I, I, I remember when I first started working as a therapist, working with an adolescent, and um, he was about to be medicated for uh, being hyperactive. And I asked some questions the therapists are not trained to ask. <laughs> Tell me about what you eat. Yeah, I've well, never. You know, the food coloring and the well, additives for food create hyperactivity. Yeah. Um, so there's a direct correlation between food and our mental state. And there's another piece. Our mental state is also psychologically impacted mm. by our relationship with healthy eating. In other words, if you're eating organic food and you go out to a farm stand and buy some fruits and vegetables and eat them, well, of course they're nutritious and don't have the harmful effects of the additives and the chemicals. But there's another piece. That other piece is how rewarding and nurturing is it yeah. yourself? And that's incalculable. We can't measure the benefit of that because that is self-nurturing. Does self-nurturing impact our state of mind? Well, obviously. Yeah. It's like saying, does meditation help us? Well, we know that. Does exercise help us? Of course. Yeah. So in other words, it, this is about shifting our mindset and understanding that how we feel about ourselves, how we perceive things, how we experience ourselves and others is in a state of possibility. Mm. And all of these things impact that possibility. I like that. It's very holistic, Mel. I, I appreciate that because I think a lot of therapists I've talked to in the past for myself don't focus on that sort of more holistic picture. It's kind of just looking at the root and, you know, but don't don't consider all these other things that could be going on in their lives. I, I remember working with a middle-aged woman who was um, suffering from depression and she was about to go into medication for it. Mm. And I asked her a lot of questions and I said, tell me about your diet. I didn't know where I was going with this. And she tells me about her diet and and I learned that she eats tuna, tuna fish at virtually every meal. Okay, interesting. And I said, wow. I said, you know, there's a correlation between mercury poisoning, yep. and depression. Have you ever had your mercury levels tested? No, she had not. Well, she did. She had extremely high levels of mercury. Wow. So we went into a process of removing the mercury, which is easy to do. Um, we stopped working together, so I can't tell you the outcome was what I was hoping for. But if there's a correlation between mercury and depression, and most people have no idea of their mercury levels, don't we owe it to ourselves to look into these things? We have to take ownership of our physical, emotional, psychological health. It's not up to them. Right. We need to be in charge. I, I agree wholeheartedly. That's one of the things I've been preaching and part of my mission is to get, get people to embrace their lives and their health themselves. I mean, I think that we do, even with my own doctor right now, I'm looking at switching because he's one of those doctors that I come in, he talks to me for five minutes and he's trying to put me on a script without even really trying to understand real which is a whole other thing I'd love. I've heard you talk about is the overuse of medications um, in the treatment of mental health. And uh, I proud to say today, I don't take anything because I just, I don't like altering my mind with these things because I'd rather understand my thoughts than, than try to just suppress them or get this sort of, I don't know, fake sense of feeling good, I guess. Well, whether it's fake or not, but you know, I'd and rather not care. You've also touched on something else here, which is our healthcare system. Oh, good. <laughs> I remember yeah. years ago walking into a doctor's office, uh, ear, nose, and throat doctor. I had an issue I needed to address. Never met him before. He walks in, asks me my name to make sure I'm the right patient. Yeah. Walks over to his desk, turns his back to me, looks at his computer screen, and he starts to speak of symptoms, which are not my symptoms. 
Oh, good said, Lord. You had such and that, this and that? I said, no. I said, I think you're looking at the wrong person. His back is still to me. Oh, my gosh. I said, listen, it would be a good idea to turn around your chair and look at me and talk to me. We don't know each other. I'm not up on your screen. I'm sitting here. Oh my we goodness. need to take charge of our health care. I will not work with a doctor yeah. who will not be collaborative, where we work together to design my treatment and what we'll do or not. We have to be responsible because we have a health care system, which is like a, a mass factory yeah. humanizing. You know, the average uh, lifespan of an American declined over the last number of years. An anomaly in, in the world. In nowhere in Europe did lifespans decline. They went up. And I'm not speaking here about COVID. Okay, right. Prior to that. Our longevity is declining pre-COVID. Mm. That should send off an alarm. So we can prosper emotionally, psychologically, hopefully physically, when we decide to take charge. It's my life, it's my thoughts, my feelings, my body, my relationships, my communication. And it's awesome, it's, it's so inspiring to realize that all this power resides within me. Yeah. Now, I'm so glad I had you on today. I, I, I'm really glad because it's exactly the things I'm really coming to realize myself and that I'm, I'm really trying to help others understand that, you know, you become empowered when, when, when you take charge of these things and that you have the right to do these things. People won't push back on their doctors. They won't even, you know, or, or therapists or other people to, to really try to get, you know, <sighs> to the root of the problems. I mean, we're, we're, one of the things I, I, I really also enjoyed that you've talked about is the overuse. Um, and I don't want to misquote you, so please correct me. When we talk about um, using psychological labels, like from the DSM-4 manual and those type of things, is that people, you know, get categorized, whether it's a, a physical health or a mental health condition. And they accept that and they don't just accept it, but it becomes their fate. And, you know, I just interviewed a guy who was it last year who has multiple sclerosis. And of course, you probably know what multiple sclerosis, there's no cure for it, at least at this point. But he found a way through lifestyle. I'm a big lifestyle guy through lifestyle to be at least less than the symptoms from his disease. Now, many people who unfortunately succumb to that disease, it could end up with the worst. But he kind of looked at it different, said, no, I'm going to go out. He's a bodybuilder. He's going to go out and use bodybuilding and nutrition to treat the symptoms, which was completely against the grain of what his doctor was telling him to do. And he said, no, you know, this is my body. I know some things about my body and I know how it reacts. And he went forward with it. So I'm really glad to hear yourself as a psychotherapist embracing, again, as I said, this holistic approach, because all of these things have an effect on, you know, even though we have specialists, you're a specialist of dealing with people with thoughts and the mind, right? But at least it sounds like you have enough knowledge about the body, and nutrition, and those type of things to realize it's all having an impact. Michael, I, I was introduced recently, just last week to a therapist. And she asked me a very innocuous question. Oh, What's your approach? What kind of therapy do you practice? <laughs> oh, yeah. and I, I had a few moments um, reflection and I thought, hmm, do I really want to go there? <laughs> there is no name label to what I do. Yeah. <laughs> it turned out that my judgment was wrong because she actually was a very integrative uh, therapist and completely understood and appreciated my approaches. But I just want to come back to the DSM labels, yeah, diagnostic labels that were given. Yeah. And you know, I, I refer to this in my book. Yes. A label, and I know you know this, but I'm speaking to yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. To your listeners. Um, a label isn't an actual thing. Now people say, well, what do you mean? Well, 
let's say some decades ago, uh, the, the DSM is a team of psychiatrists to sit around and create new diagnoses. So let's say some decades ago, there was a lot of talk about people having um, distractibility. They weren't paying attention. And there was a lot of hyper, hyperactive behavior. And the team of psychiatrists to form the DSM said, there is, we need a diagnosis for this. So they called it ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactive, Hyperactive Disorder. Now, as a description, good progress. We're describing what we think we see. Yeah. But we then, in a moment, turn a description into an actual thing. Yeah. And we say, Jane has ADHD. Mm. Jane <laughs> can't have ADHD because ADHD isn't an actual thing. You see, we do this in our culture, in all cultures. Our mind makes something up, a description. And then we forget that mind made it up and it becomes a thing, it becomes real. We lose our effectiveness when we do this. Yeah. So ADHD as a description of what we think we see, that's, that's progress and we can work with that. But when mind forgets it made up the label and then thinks the label is real, then we're stuck. Yeah. Because the thing takes on a power and yeah. then we stop looking at what's causing the thing. Look, we talk about ego. Yeah. There's a big ego. He has a small ego. Ego this. Is ego an actual thing? No. It's a word that was used to describe processes. We need to come back into power, which is to understand that our thoughts create words to represent things. Mm -hmm. But they're not the actual thing. That shifts us back into the fact that we exist in a reality of energy yeah we are energy and we are not things we are not newtonian 17th century objects we are energy operating in a human body and when we come back into energy and harness our energy and learn to see our thinking and our belief systems life can be an entirely different experience that is it's just fantastic way of summing it up, Mel. I, I one of the things I think that's kept me following a lot of your thinking is because it was a lot of things that I wondered about through my experiences and, and questioned about whether well, what made me really think about it is a number of times I've heard somebody talk about their diagnosis, right? And all of a sudden it's changed. Well, now they think I have this, or now they think I have that. And it's like, boy, coming up with a label for something just seems like it's not really helping anything. It seems like one, people become trapped in it because it's almost as if it's an excuse to say, well, you know, I have ADHD, so that's why I don't pay attention. And so, I mean, I found myself having said that. I was labeled back in my day, it was called hyperactivity disorder. And my mother, did get me help for being able to pay attention and things. But in some ways, I think it did hold me back because of the fact that that's what I always thought I was. And like you said, it, it, it becomes part of you. I have this disorder. Yeah, so it victimizes us. Now, that's not to say that you might not have said, listen, I struggle to pay attention. Right. All right, I have a hard time paying attention. When that becomes undeniable, the question is, what can we do? Right. Right. So to not victimize ourselves, depression. So often in my work as a therapist, someone will describe their life circumstances. My husband just left me for a younger woman. We don't have a divorce agreement. I don't have any alimony or child support. I have two young children. I don't know how to make ends meet and I'm heartbroken. And my psychiatrist says, I'm depressed. I need to go on antidepressants. I said, well, <laughs> if you didn't feel depressed, I'd be concerned. That is what I call situational depression, distinct from clinical depression. Mm. 
Sometimes you have a right temporarily to feel depressed. That is actually useful. It is utilitarian. You're not in denial. We can do something about this. To equate situational depression with clinical depression is simply dumb, wrong-minded, and part of the pathology of yeah. the medical apparatus in this country and in the world that we live in. We victimize the victims with these labels. Mel, you know, you just triggered one more thought. And I know we're coming up on time too, but I wanted to, I, another thought I was thinking about with my general practitioner years ago, a prior doctor I had, who I was talking about, um, I think it was either anxiety and or depression. And my GP, without sending me to, you know, a, a therapist or a mental health professional prescribed mental health medication to me. And I'm just, when I look back and think about that now, I mean, okay, maybe in his mind, he thought he was helping, but boy, is that, it's just dangerous. It is. And, you know, just a closing thought here, Michael. Yeah. Um, I am not universally opposed to prescription medication. Same here. Yep. And I work with a, in collaboration with a brilliant young psychiatrist, um, if anyone's listening, I'm going to throw his name out. Yeah, sure. Time to Dr. Frank, Dr. Frank Appa, A-P-P-A-H. And he's in Connecticut. You can contact him. But he works through DNA testing. In other words, through a saliva test, they will determine what medication is going to be best utilized by your body. So it's not try this, come back and a month later. How is that working? Now try this. But no, let's get some clarity um, on your DNA and what medication can work best or not. Let's do it in a thoughtful, measured way. We need to get more doctors thinking this way. And Mel, I think, as you mentioned earlier too, if we feel empowered, which we should, to go and, sorry, I don't know if the word demand or whatever, but these things of our, of our professionals that we work with, we need them but we also need to, for them to help them help us in a better way. Yeah, it has to be collaborative yep. and we have to be operating proactively in our own best interest in all areas of our life. My gosh, now I tell you, I, I'm so excited you know, that we, we were able to do this today and I, I thank you so much for your time. This has been just an absolute pleasure. Um, you could stick around just for one minute right after we, we cut off the recording here. But friends, I just wanna remind you, let's see if it comes in here. The Possibility Principle, Mel's book, you can get it on most major retail. I know it's available on Amazon and all the other uh, major booksellers. MelSchwartz.com is the best way to follow Mel. And Mel, do you have any other things or closing thoughts or? Well, my closing thought is, I don't know if you know it or not, but you precipitated my speaking about things today, which I don't think I've ever spoken about in any interview. Awesome. Well, so, you know, I'll to you. Thank you. No, well, Mel, you know, I think what I'm trying to do is get folks to think a little differently. And I'm glad to hear that that's, that's done. So I look forward to chatting with you. Stick around one second and uh, everybody. Thank you for joining in today. I hope you enjoyed the show.